Hello and welcome to Ask for a Trend. I'm Josh Lipton. In the next half hour, we are breaking down the trends of today that'll move stocks tomorrow. There's a lot to keep track of, so we're focused on what you need to know to get ahead of the curve. Here's some of the trends we're going to be diving into. Investors watch the S&P 500 rise today, taking it back into positive territory for the year. And broader market gains continue thanks to tech stocks and investor confidence from yesterday's trade war truce announcement. We're going to break down what these moves mean for your investments. And quantum computing company Regetti reports its Q1 earnings Earnings. We're getting important insights from its CEO, who is joining us live. And vacations and staycations may be getting way more interesting. Airbnb is widening its offerings for more than a place to sleep. We'll explore what's new and whether it will support the company's bottom line. Rigetti Computing seeing a decrease in revenue for the first quarter compared to the fourth quarter. However, the company estimating it is about five years away from demonstrating quantum advantage. Rigetti CEO and President Sabod Kalkarni joins us now to discuss. Sabod, it is good to see you. Let's start with this earnings report, Sabod, because it's the first time we've gotten a chance to talk to you about it. It does look like the Q1 revenue misses expectations, misses consensus there. It looked also like gross margins declined from the year earlier. Walk us through the, the print, though, Sabo. I'm curious what you are seeing in the business. Yeah, indeed, the numbers, um, uh, sales did decline from last year, and the gross margins were lighter than last year. However, we fundamentally, in quantum computing, are uh, a technology development company. Uh, the technology milestones and how we are accomplishing them and the timeline for that is far more critical than uh, sales at this point of the journey. Uh, sales are primarily coming from uh, what we give to academic researchers or government national labs. So those are one-off contracts. They are lumpy in nature. Some quarters you will see spikes, some quarters like this one, uh, when, the, when those don't happen, you do see a decline. When the numbers are small, you do get, tend to get this spiky behavior, lumpy behavior. So we try not to focus too much on sales at this point in the journey of the company. Uh, as you correctly pointed out, we are four to five years from real commercial value of quantum computing. That's where the market is really supposed to grow and be large enough where Things like sales and EPS start becoming much more critical at that point. At this point, it's all about technology development and how we are getting the milestones done so that we enable this large $100 plus billion market in the future. So, Bo, taking a step back for the uninitiated, help us explain, in layman's terms, to the extent possible, what is the difference, Sabo, between quantum computers and supercomputers and what your competitive advantage, Sabo, is in this market? Fundamentally, quantum computing is a way of doing much higher computing than a supercomputer and consuming a lot less energy. So we can be a million or even a billion times faster than a supercomputer uh, and consume a lot less energy. And the reason behind that is we use what is called qubits. We entangle those qubits. That allows us exponentially better computing power than a classical supercomputer. So imagine the world's number one supercomputer is sitting in Oak Ridge National Lab right now. It's the size of a, a big building, basically. It costed the US government hundreds of millions of dollars. The same work that a, the supercomputer is doing right now, we, could we can do potentially with a single chip uh, and consume a lot less energy at the same time. Now, when we have powerful chips, we should be able to do as I said, thousands and maybe millions of times more computing power than a supercomputer. So fundamentally, it's a different way of doing computing. In classical computers, you have just two states, zero and one. In quantum, we have multiple states. And on top of that, we tend to couple the qubits, which gives us the exponential power of computing. So think of it as a super, super computer at a lot less energy consumption in a much more smaller form factor. So exciting potential, huge market opportunity, but we are still very much in the R&D stages. We need to continue to perfect the technology to enable this future. And, and Sabot, I mean, obviously, listen, the street's excited about this technology and investors mm -hmm. are excited about this technology. But in terms of when it's actually you know, really commercially viable, you say still years away. Why years, Sabot? It gets into the nitty gritty of where we are in quantum computing. There are things we um, uh, measure routinely, things like the quality of the qubits in terms of the uh, error rates, the number of qubits, the gate speeds, and gets into a lot of technical metrics. Uh, and right now they work. I mean, uh, quantum computers work. They can do your standard computing. It's just not faster or cheaper than your regular computers. So there's really no point in using a quantum computer for practical workload today. The reason for excitement is we can extrapolate and we can see that once we are 
above a thousand qubits and above a fidelity level of what we call 99.9% two qubit gate fidelity and gates are fast enough and we do error corrections, we can project and see that indeed a quantum computer will be a million or a billion times faster than your fastest computer today and consume a lot less energy. So it's the projections that give us the confidence that uh, we will be able to get there. But as of today, none of us have a quantum computer that we can show a data center and say, use it, you will get this practical benefit today compared to your uh, HPC cluster or a supercomputer. So, Bo, you know, th there's some broader issues, concerns out there for investors. You know them well. Worries about the economy. Worries about the Trump tariffs. I'm just curious, Sabo, have those impacted, affected at all how you're leading this company right now in terms of just the decisions you want to make about about investing, about spending, about hiring? Uh, not really. At this stage, uh, since we are primarily focused on R&D, things like tariffs. Uh, don't matter to us as much uh, because most of our expenses are in the U.S. Most of them are salary type expenses. So uh, tariffs fundamentally don't hit us. And we are not selling many things to any foreign governments where the reciprocal tariffs becomes an issue. So as of right now, tariffs is not an issue. Long term, obviously, we watch what's going to happen if there's significant tariffs for parts that we are buying from outside the US, it will impact us to some extent. Uh, and same, if there are reciprocal tariffs when we are selling quantum computers or quantum computing as a service to foreign uh, countries, uh, that would impact us too. So long term, it absolutely will make a difference. But as of today, while we are doing R&D, tariffs is not as big an issue. Even the economy, the macro factors like the uh, the GDP or inflation, those kinds of factors that are typically very important for a traditional company with a mature business are not as important when you're doing early stage R&D work as we are doing right now in quantum computing. So, Bo, you know, we're talking tariffs, so we have to talk China. I am very curious to get your take on this, which is kind of the broader geopolitical competition with China, Sabo, when it comes to quantum computing. Uh, China is intent on becoming a true global tech powerhouse, Sabot. I mean, how does the U.S. right now stack up, Sabot? How does it compare and contrast with China when it comes to this field, quantum computing? I mean, quantum computing is a very high stakes area right now. It is being viewed as a critical technology by just about all the developed economies of the world, certainly US, China included, but many Western European and Asian countries as well. And the stakes are indeed high because the company or country that owns quantum computing has a huge advantage over everyone else. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is encryption, decryption. Almost all of our information right now is encrypted with some form of RSA or AES encryption. And it works because a standard computer, even a supercomputer, cannot break it. With the quantum computers, we have shown with models that you can relatively easily break AES or RSA encryption. So the stakes are very high. I mean, if a rogue company or a rogue country got quantum computers before we do, they could not only hack into our information, they could take our information and encrypt it with a quantum computer. So we don't even have any access to our prior information. So stakes are indeed very high. That's why governments are very much aware of it. Uh, regarding your specific question, um, we all are very keenly looking at what countries like China are doing. And uh, China is investing extremely aggressively in quantum computing. Um, and we really don't know exactly where they are. Uh, as of right now, based on uh, publications and patent literatures, we have a good sense that they are making rapid progress, uh, we, but we don't know exactly where they are. So US, if quantum computing as a field generally started in the US and Europe came along uh, at, at the same time. Uh, right now, we believe companies like us, along with IBM and Google, are in the lead uh, globally. But we have to be careful. China may be catching up, may be very close, and maybe even ahead, and we just don't know. This is an area where they are not going to openly divulge if you are ahead, if this is a critical asset. If you are indeed ahead of other countries, you are definitely not going to tell the other countries to that you are ahead. So it's an area of extreme concern for everyone, and that's why our government, along with other uh, Western uh, European governments are taking this area very, very seriously. Sabod, great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Josh. Stick around, much more Ask for a Trend still to come. The S&P 500 wipes out 2025 losses as Nvidia powers the tech rally. And Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery joins us now with the trading day takeaways. Jared.
That's right, Josh. AI back to AI trade, and we are nearing records. The S&P 500 not only positive for the year, but it is within four percentage points of a record high. And I just wanted to show you what else is really close here. So don't get worried. I'm going to show you some red, but the red is how close these are to the record high. So XLI, that's industrials within 2%, financials within 3%, and there's that S&P 500 within four, tech right behind. Then you got utilities, communication services uh, within five, and the list goes on. And just to show you in the NASDAQ who's really close, we got some names that are at or near, the, near those records right now. Now these, to be fair, these are from the 52-week highs, uh, but a lot of those are just uh, the same thing as records. So Zscaler, Charter, Axon, Booking, Mercado Libre, Palantir. Palantir hit another uh, record high today. So it's been an impressive run. And I also have a list of stocks that are actually hitting record stocks today. And guess what? Palantir is in that list. It's the biggest one. By the way, that is a 300 billion dollar company right now, if you believe that. Uber, another one, hitting record highs. That's up to 191 billion. And there is uh, Libre again. And uh, you know, you put it all together, we're in a very nice bullish place, not to say we're out of the woods, but- uh, you know, We're not, because I thought, I thought yes. you pop the champagne and it's, it's smooth sailing ahead. Well, I got something to tell you about the treasury market. Um, I did this whole spiel this morning about how bonds, uh, how bond yields and also uh, the dollar were kind of moving in lockstep. And that was since last Thursday, post-Fed meeting. And guess what they did today? They did the opposite thing. So they went in different directions. Nevertheless, it was a risk on day, to be fair. And so this didn't disrupt the risk on trade. But I want to show you the 10-year has now hit 4.5%. Uh, it's starting to raise some eyebrows again. Let me show you the year to date for some content context and you can see it has been higher. I think that was 4.75% towards the beginning of the year. But these big, it's not quite round, but these big numbers like this do catch attention. And then we have the US dollar index, and that actually was lower on the day. Now, a lot of people, a lot of positioning on the street, and we just got this big Bank of America Global Fund Manager survey, um, the, the street is incredibly short dollars. My hypothesis is we're gonna go back up, and that's based on a multi-year reversion to the mean. We've done this many times before, we had a little bit of an oops to the downside here, but guess what? We just had an oops to the upside. And so I think we're probably more than not going to head higher. I don't expect that to weigh on risk markets as long as we have yields and dollar marching in the same direction. Don't have time to get into that right now because I want to get into a clip about related uh, CPI this morning. Joe Bruce Wellis sat down with him uh, over at RSM with for Stocks and Translation episode last week, and he was talking about uh, the impact of tariffs taking a while to take effect, and he was even uh, predicting that this CPI report that we got today wasn't going to be that bad, but watch out for future months. Here's what he said. Next week, we're going to get to CPI. You'll start to see little bits of it, dribs and drabs from the tariffs that were put on early in the administration. And this will be April CPI. Yeah, April CPI, that's correct. Thank you, Jared. Um, but it will take a, a bit more time. Right now, it's more anecdotal, like Gene Soroka informing all of us that, hey, an event's about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so this time, it, it really does feel like we've got a recession that's in train, no pun intended. We've assigned a 55% probability, and we, we think that's about right. Um, you know, our baseline scenario is a recession. Our alternative to the baseline is slower growth. All right, that episode coming out in the near future. Gene Soroka, by the way, head of the port of LA, and he's saying watch out because things are not looking good there in terms of the volume of shipments coming down. With this new trade tariff def uh, detente, we'll have to see. We shall. Thank you, Jared. All right. Appreciate it. Stick around. Much more Ashford trends still to come. Airbnb has introduced a new feature that allows travelers to book services and experiences such as getting a massage, a haircut, or a chef-prepared meal that could be added to a stay. For more, let's welcome in now Ellie Mertz, Airbnb CFO. Ellie, it is good to see you. So let's dig right into this news. Airbnb services, Ellie. Walk us through what this means. Yes. So when you think about why people choose a particular type of accommodation, often they are looking for what kind of services are available with that accommodations. And usually, you know, they look for hotels for those services. And starting today, you can book those services through Airbnb. We're offering things like chefs, catering, uh, private prepared meals, massages, uh, photography, such that your trips are even more special. And how, how does, how much would, would this cost me, Ellie, these haircuts and massages? 
So we're trying to make sure that we have not only extremely high quality offerings on the platform, but they're also at a variety of price points. So in terms of the services that we're launching with today, uh, approximately 50% of our service providers have an offering that starts under $50. It's really important that our products are accessible to a wide variety of guests. And how do you pick the folks, Ellie, who are providing these services? How do you pick the hairstylist, the masseuse, the chef? Yeah, so we're making sure that we're vetting our service providers for quality. Obviously, we're verifying their identification. We're also reviewing their licenses, their certifications. What we want to make sure is that when you come to Airbnb to book a service, you can trust us that it's high quality, that we've vetted the service provider, and that you're very likely to have a really great experience and service with us. So that was the the, the services. You also announced into uh, Airbnb experiences. Walk us through the details yeah. of that. Yeah, so today, in addition to services, we also launched a reimagined Airbnb experiences product. And the way to think about this offering is it's unforgettable experiences hosted by locals who know their city best. Uh, what we know about travel is that you know, approximately 70% of guests look for destinations where there's you know, particular experiences that they are looking to have. We know they're also looking for authenticity in those experiences as well as human connections. And so that's really imbued in terms of the product offering that we've, we've launched today. If I was an Airbnb investor, Ellie, I might be yes. thinking this sounds fun and exciting and innovative and dynamic. I'd probably also be thinking, Ellie, when is it all going to actually translate into yes. material, meaningful revenue growth for the company? Do you think, is it 25? Is it 26? What do you see ahead? Well, so today is day one. Uh, we're really excited to open up these offerings, not just to our guests, but also to you know attract new hosts to both our services offering as well as experience offering. So today is day zero. It will take time to grow, but the goal with these offerings is to deliver material incremental revenue growth to the top line in the years to come. Uh, Ellie, these could be really large. I'm businesses. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I cut you off. I was like, these will be. Uh, we expect these to be very large businesses over time. Ellie, I know when you reported earnings earlier this month, the Q2 outlook was below consensus, at least revenue and room nights. And some of that was due in part to the softness in the U.S. I'm just curious, what are you all seeing now in the business? Any, any more color and commentary you can add there? So no updates since our earnings call. What I would say is that our guidance was for quite strong revenue. So in Q2, we got it to 9 to 11% revenue growth. And what we shared is that uh, first holiday of the quarter, Easter, we saw very strong travel in particular in Europe as well as Latin America. So it was sh shaving up to be a nice quarter. And, and, and to the degree that you navigate this relative softness in the US though, Ellie, how do you navigate? What, what le levers can you pull over there? Well, one thing that's interesting to note about our business is that it's extremely adaptable. So we certainly saw this in the pandemic and I believe we're seeing it today as well when certain corridors of travel become closed, others open. So currently, you know, we, we have seen as, as others in travel have that there's been a decline in terms of inbound travel to the US. And yet we see those travelers are just choosing different destinations. And given the fact that Airbnb is, is virtually, you know, all over the globe, we offer other places for people to stay, even if they're not choosing to come to the US right now. There was a recent report, Ellie, I'm looking at, at Reuters here, talking about how foreign travel spending in the U.S. to decline 7% in 2025. That's a headline. That seems like a big number. I'm curious to get your take. Is that kind of dovetail with what you're seeing, and how would you navigate that kind of dynamic? Yeah, so we are seeing a decline in terms of inbound travel to the U.S., However, it's a very, very small portion of our business. So order of magnitude, inbound travel to the US is approximately two to 3% of our global business. And what we see even in that corridor is, for example, Canadians, if they're traveling less to the US, what we see instead is that they're traveling more domestically and they're traveling more to Mexico, to Brazil, to France, Japan. The, the, the travel demand is still distributed across the platform. Ellie, great to have you on the show today. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Well, that is a wrap on today's Ask for a Trend. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Eastern for all of the latest market moving stories affecting your wallet. Have a great night.